trade craft. Within weeks of getting Einstein's letter, President Roosevelt formed the Uranium Committee, a group of military leaders and scientists. Their goal was to figure out the basics of how an atomic bomb might work and what materials they would, would be needed. The project got off to a slow start. Sixteen different teams were spread out among the country. They began with a budget of just $6,000. An alarmed Einstein sent a second letter to President Roosevelt. Since the outbreak of the war, interest in uranium has intensified in Germany, Einstein warned. I have now learned that research there is being carried out in great secrecy. The race to build the atomic bomb was on. Just about the last person anyone would expect to be involved was Harry Gold. When World War II began, Gold was a 28-year-old chemist living with his parents and younger brother in a working-class Philadelphia neighborhood. He stood five foot six with thick black hair and a soft round face. Friends described him as shy, smart, and always ready to help anyone who asked. He was the kind of guy who seemed to blend in with the background, who, would, who could come and go from a room without being noticed. You'd never in a million years believe this guy was a spy, one neighbor later said. And yet Harry Gold was about to become a major player in what FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover would call the crime of the century. It all began one snowy night in February 1933 in the depths of the Great Depression. Like millions of Americans, Gold had been laid off from his job. His family was way behind on rent and facing eviction from their apartment. One night after another homeless, hopeless job search, Gold was resting at home when a friend came racing through the door. The friend explained that a guy he knew, Tom Black, was leaving his job at a soap factory in Jersey City. Black could arrange to get Gold the job, if Gold was willing to move to New Jersey. Gold's mother leaped up and started stuffing her son's clothes in a cardboard suitcase. Gold, followed, Gold borrowed a few dollars and hurried to the bus station. Arriving in New Jersey after midnight, he walked down slushy sidewalks to Tom Black's apartment. Black was waiting for me downstairs, Gold remembered. I could still see that huge, friendly, freckled face, the grin, and the feel of the bear-like grip of his hand. The first thing Black said was, I am a communist, and I am going to make a communist out of you. Gold earned $30 a week at the soap factory and sent $20 home to his parents. He was proud to be supporting his family and didn't mind the hard work. I was grateful to Tom Black, he later said, very much so. That was exactly what Black was counting on. Black dropped by Gold's rented room often to lecture his new friend about communism and the Soviet Union. Gold knew only the basics. Communists had taken over Russia in a recent revolution and renamed the country the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or Soviet Union. Black told Gold the Soviet government had abolished private property and was making all the decisions about what, about what the economy should produce and how goods should be distributed. In this way, Black said, the Soviets would soon wipe out the greed and poverty plaguing countries like the United States. Black pressured Gold to officially join the Communist Party. I just kept stalling, Gold explained. I had no interest in the matter whatsoever. Then came some good news. Gold's former employer, a chemical plant called the Pennsylvania Sugar Company, was hiring again. Gold was offered his old job back. He jumped the chance to move back to Philadelphia. But Tom Black didn't give up that easily. In early 1934, he came to visit Gold in Philadelphia. Harry, you've been stalling me, Black said. You've been trying to get out of joining the Communist Party. Possibly I don't blame you. This last line got Gold's attention. But there is something you can do, Black continued. There is something that would be very helpful to the Soviet Union, and something in which you can take pride. The plant where Gold worked, Black explained, 
used cutting-edge processes to produce many useful chemicals. The people of the Soviet Union need these processes, said Black. If you'll obtain as many of them as you can in complete detail and give them to me, I'll see it to it that those processes are turned over to the Soviet Union. Gold took a long moment before saying, I'll think it over. But actually, he later explained, I had already formed my judgment. Yes, I would. Some spies do it for the money. Others are trying to change the world. Gold's reasons were a lot less dramatic. He was thankful to Black for getting him a job and wanted to repay the debt. Also, Gold had what he described as an almost puppy-like eagerness to please. He was a, here was a chance to do something nice for Black and help the Soviet people. The chemical processes Black wanted didn't seem so secret, and if the information could really help the Soviets build a better society, why not share it? Who would it hurt? And that, said Gold, is how I began. Gold started sneaking documents out of his lab, plans and formulas for making industrial chemicals. Every few weeks, he'd travel to New York City to meet with a Soviet contact. Gold knew these men only by fake first names. He'd hand over his stash of stolen documents, then hang around a and hang around a coffee shop while the papers were copied. He got the papers back, rode back to Philadelphia, and returned the documents before anyone noticed they were missing. By the time World War II began, Gold had given the Soviets every bit of useful information the, Pen the Pennsylvania Sugar Company had in its files. He was tired of the long trips to New York, the constant lies to his family. Besides, Gold was starting to realize the Soviet Union was hardly the workers' paradise Tom Black had described. In fact, it was a police state ruthlessly run by Joseph Stalin, the dictator who arrested and executed his political rivals, just like Hitler. Equally disturbing to Gold was the news that just days before the war started, Stalin and Hitler had signed a special pact agreeing not to fight each other. Why would Stalin make a deal with the devil? Gold wondered. He was convinced it was time to leave his secret life behind. The Soviets had different ideas. Gold's Soviet contact, known to Gold only as Fred, told Gold to get a job at a weapons factory, some place with technology worth stealing. And Fred wanted Gold to start recruiting other spies with technical knowledge. I am giving you orders, Fred shouted. When Gold hesitated, Fred went further. Should Gold ever get the idea of walking away from the Soviets, Fred assured Gold that his boss would get an anonymous note about all about, all about Gold's illegal activities. You'll be finished, Fred shouted, and don't think we will hesitate to do this. Life improved a bit under Gold's next Soviet contact, a man Gold knew as Sam. During long walks along New York City streets, Sam gave Gold a basic education in tradecraft, the art and science of spying. Gold was taught never to use his real name when doing secret work, never to share his address. He learned to sit at booths in restaurants because they kept him more hidden than tables. On the subway, he sat right next to the doors. If he was being tailed, he could wait for a stop let the doors begin to close, then leap up and jump out of, as the doors shut behind him. Gold was never to attend communist meetings, never to read communist papers, never to express even the slightest interest in the Soviet Union. The main rule was this, present the appearance of a normal American. Gold enjoyed these talks and even felt comfortable enough to bring up his concerns about the Soviet Union, including Stalin's treaty with Adolf Hitler. What the hell? Gold asked. Look, you fool, Sam said, laughing. What the Soviet Union needs more than anything in the world is time. Precious time. Stalin had no intention of keeping the agreement, Sam said. But the deal gave the Soviets time to build up their military strength. And when the proper hour comes, you'll see. We'll sweep over Germany and Hitler like nothing ever imagined. 